I recently took a trip to Elgin up in Moray. I've been there a lot over the years, so if you'll forgive a moment of self-indulgence, I'd like to show off a few points of interest. I don't really have a segue, so... So here, cosily between Burger King and uh, Industrial Estate, Not far from where I'm staying is a memorial to the Order Pot. The Order Pot was a large, deep pool, thought to have been a former channel of the River Lossie. In centuries gone, it was used for trials by ordeal, that is, suspected witches were submerged and ultimately drowned in order to test their guilt. This was based on the perfectly sound logic that water would reject those who had rejected God. To quote Jimmy the Sixth's demonology, It appears that God hath appointed for a supernatural sign of the monstrous impiety of the witches that the water shall refuse to receive them in her bosom, that have shaken off them the sacred water of baptism, and willfully refuse the benefit thereof. The pool itself was filled up in the 19th century, and in 1890 Elgin Town Council erected the memorial. It explained that, though popularly believed to be bottomless, it was filled up in 1881, thus falsifying, it is hoped, an ancient prophecy. The order pot and the lossy grey shall sweep the Chandry Kirk away. Just a short walk away sits Elkin Cathedral. Built in the 13th century, this once called Lantern of the North has long been extinguished, but its grounds still hold a wealth of history. Up to 1206, Murray's bishop didn't have an official HQ, so a cathedral really just being where the bishop's throne sits, the cathedral jumped between Burney, Kinnerda or Spiney, whichever was convenient to the chap in charge at the time. Somewhere during 1207-1208, Bishop Bryce Douglas had a word with Pope Innocent III about settling the cathedral somewhere. Canedo was deemed too difficult for parishioners to get to, so they settled for the Church of the Holy Trinity of Spiney. Papal permission was received, and it was inaugurated as the official cathedral for the Bishop of Murray. Which was nice and all, Bryce got to appoint a dean, precentor, archdeacon, all that good stuff. It wasn't very secure, however, and in 1224, new Bishop Andrew of Murray was given the papal go-ahead to transfer cathedral status to a new church near the more fortified Elgin. It's worth noting that there does seem to have been a building on the site already. It's thought that Bishop Bryce had a word with Pope Innocent III back at the Fourth Lateran Council, discussing the possibility of a new, more splendid building near Elgin. At any rate, in 1224, Bishop Gilbert of Caithness consecrated the ground, and the Church of the Holy Trinity juxta Elgin became the new cathedral grounds. The building, splendid though it was, saw some adjustment over the centuries. In 1270, a fire destroyed part of the church. Reconstruction saw the choir double in length, a new aisle on each side, and the building of the chapter house. Construction would have finished just in time for English King Edward I to sweep through the area in 1296, though he seems to have left the cathedral be. The same could not be said of his son, the future Edward II, whose army damaged the canonry in 1303, retaliation for Bishop David Murray's opposition to England's interference in Scotland. Murray went on to support Robert the Bruce for king, jogging off to Orkney until Eddie I died a year later. He returned to Elgin, submitting to Eddie II for all of three seconds, before returning his support to Robbie B. Years pass, King Robert dies, and another Edward has a pop at subjugating the north. Much of the northeast, including Elgin, was burned, though Edward III seems to have taken after his grandfather, and the cathedral escaped the war unscathed. All in all, as buildings go, it had been remarkably fortunate. In 1390, the cathedral was destroyed. Mostly. It was the climax of a bitter feud between Murray's Bishop Burr and the generally pleasant chap that history would come to know as the Wolf of Frankly, he deserves his own video, but in short, Alexander Stuart, third son of the king, began blobbing up land like a veteran Crusader Kings player. Under his stewardship, Catarans wandered hither and thither, enforcing his will, and law and order in the north was practically non existent. Ultimately, he threw a hissy fit when the church had the temerity to demand that he stop living with his side piece and return to his wife. Bishop Burr bought some protection, but to no avail, as Stuart raised an army of Catarans to destroy Forez and put Elgin Cathedral to the flame. It got rebuilt yet again, though not before an entirely other Alexander plundered and burned the area. Rebuilding would be completed around the mid-1400s, and is where we get much of the fascinating carvings and masonry we see around the place. 
tranquil visages of the saintly, and grotesque warnings against sin. The 16th century saw the beginning of a slow and sad end to the cathedral's splendour. Protestant Reformation was underway, and with Elgin Cathedral not being a parish church, it fell out of favour, with bishops moving to St Giles in the centre of town. 1562 saw it purged of popish trappings. In 1567, the Privy Council ordered its lead roof removed, and in 1637, a gale blew the choir roof off. Three years later, Elgin's parish minister tore down the rude screen with its stars of bright gold to be used for firewood. Finally, in 1711, on Easter Sunday, the centre tower collapsed, taking much of the nave with it. While this may have been the death knell for the main structure, the grounds would continue being used as a cemetery, the southern quarrel in particular being used to bury the Dukes of Gordon. All over the grounds we find Reformation-era gravestones covered in memento mori, hourglasses to remind us to live while we can, wings to reassure of the soul's release, and skulls because it looks super fucking metal. While I am the odd sort to enjoy a quiet stroll through a graveyard, there is one last thing that originally drew me to this place. On the north side of the crossing is a 19th century pictured slab unearthed near St Giles. On one side we see a cross, figures in the corner, and a top zoomorphic knotwork. The reverse depicts a hunting scene, topped with a double disc and Z-rod, above a crescent and V-rod. Common enough picture symbology, but about which we know vanishingly little. This is but one example of Pictish art found all over Scotland, largely in the northeast, the centre of Pictish power. On the outskirts of Forres, safely encased in glass, is seven metres of further example. This is Swainoth Stone, misnamed for original theories that it describes a battle against Danish king Svein Forkbeard. On one side are two figures leaning over a central one, with two more attending the background. The space above is occupied mainly with intricate knotwork decorating a large ringed cross. The reverse side is significantly more eventful, and does chronicle a great battle. Almost 100 figures feature in the piece, from amassing foot soldiers down to cavalry in flight, battle joined to the decapitated dead. It's generally agreed that the stone records an actual historical event, however the identity of the belligerents remains shrouded. Three possibilities are offered. Firstly, while we can discount any involvement by Svein, the scene could show local forces, picked Scott or both, successfully repelling marauding Danes. Second is that the stone describes the southern Scots ending the supremacy of northern Pictish power and Kenneth MacAlpin, or one of his dynasty, supplanting the Pictish royal line with the Scottish. This at least has tentative support from the resemblance of the worn scene beneath the cross to the seal of Schoon Abbey depicting the inauguration of the King of the Scots. Thirdly, it could refer to one of Kenneth's successors, King Dub MacAlpin. He was killed by Murray men in Forres in 966. His body was found after the battle under a bridge at nearby Kinloss potentially shown in the bottom panel, along with other beheaded bodies, his head framed to stress its importance. The scene below the cross, then, is the burial of Dub. These are examples of more common theories, but like much regarding Pictish art, the matter is still very much up for debate. While we're in Forres, it's worth confronting its own iffy history with witches, memorialised in the witch's stone. In times past, witches would be thrown down Clooney Hill in spiked barrels. When coming to rest, the barrel and its grisly contents would be put to flame. This boulder, now half buried in pavement, marks the site of such an execution. Northwest of Elgin is the small harbour town of Burkhead. It was once the site of a Pictish hill fort, once a Pictish power centre. Unfortunately, a large part of it was destroyed at the beginning of the 19th century when the town was being built. But there are remnants, such as the Dory Hill, which I'll get to, and a number of carvings of bulls. Six currently exist, two being held in the local visitor centre two in Elgin Museum, and the other two in Edinburgh and London. While the town was being built, the labourers found potable water somewhat scarce. A half-remembered legend was revived about a long-buried well in the area, where the ground sounded hollow when struck. Excavation was begun, and some 20 to 30 feet below the surface, they discovered what we now term the Burkhead Well. Originally considered to have been an ancient baptistry, the purpose of the well is obscure. Unfortunately, my sojourn to the area was at the wrong time of year to actually enter the site. But no matter, I'm more interested in another local feature, the burning of the clavi. This pagan fire festival is still held every year on the old New Year's of 11th of January. The clavi is a barrel filled with tar and wood. On the evening of the 11th it is set ablaze, held aloft and paraded round town by chosen locals, the clavi crew and their clavi king. Their path takes them to various households to present them with smouldering wood from the clavi to bring the household good luck. They end their journey at the Dory Hill, a yet extant part of the Pictish fort mentioned before, 
and the clavy is left to burn until it collapses, scattering embers over the hilltop. I'm down at Lossy Mouth. There was a slight uptick in geomagnetic activity, so there was the slightest chance I might have been able to see an aurora. No such luck, but the stars are out, and there's something to be said for sitting alone with your thoughts and the sound of the sea at night. <laughs> 